Okay, the reading for this week is Tsure uh, Zure Gusa, or Essays in Idleness, is the translation. Uh, this is a work that was written around 1330 and um, by Yoshida Kenko, who is a former court poet who became a priest. He is best known as the author of this work, and this is one of the most famous and influential works of classical Japanese literature. I've already made a, um, a study guide video about this work that goes into some more detail. Uh, in this video, the main focus is going to be the recitation by my uh, teacher's assistant, my assistant, um, Nikosan, and she will be reading uh, not the entire work because that would take too long, so she's going to be reading uh, excerpts, some of the more salient and famous passages from the work, and as you listen to her read, you will want to have the PDF file that I've given you in front of you, and it has Donald Keane's 1967 translation on the left side, and the original uh, classical Japanese text on the right side, and we will go over both of those in detail in class. So what is the Tsure Tsure Gusa? It's a collection of 243 short essays, written around 1330, as I mentioned, at a time when Buddhist beliefs were spreading in Japan, and uh, were increasingly reflected in the literature. So we see lots of uh, Buddhist images and themes in this work. Okay, so just very briefly, I'm going to read the 13 questions that are on your study guide, and again, I will put the link in the description below to the more uh, detailed uh, video about the study guide that I uh, made a, a year or so ago, so you can watch both. Okay, study questions. Yoshida Kenko is a Buddhist priest, but his attitude toward Buddhism seems rather ambivalent. Discuss his views of Buddhism, of Buddhist priests, of Buddhist principles, and so forth. Identify specific Buddhist themes, images, and messages that appear in the text. Number two, discuss what I called Kenko's double vision. That is, his unique perspective as both a Buddhist priest who understands the need to renounce worldly attachments, uh, shuchaku, and as, also as a layman of keen interest in the things of the world. So he's both, he renounces the world in the, in the manner of the Buddhist priest, but he also celebrates the things of the world and uh, has keen interest in the things of the world. Talk about this sort of duality that runs throughout the text. Cite specific examples from the text. Number three. Identify and discuss the theme of impermanence, or mujō, as we say in Japanese, uh, as it appears in the work. What does Kenko say about this central Buddhist notion of mujō? How does it function in this text, this uh, theme of mujō? Number four. According to Kenko, how long should one live? Why? What happens in late, middle, and old age? Uh, certain things happen in each of those three stages of a human life that he deplores. Uh, confirm and uh, explain, make a list of all those things that he's talking about there. Number five, what is Kenko's view of love, of sexual desire, of women, of attachment, of shiuchaku, and so forth? Cite specific passages from the text. Can we get a sense of his ideal female from his descriptions? Explain. Number six, discuss Kenko's description of his ideal house and its antithesis. I forget which uh, essay number this appears in, but it's in one of the essays. He talks about his ideal house and his, the antithesis of that. How does this description relate to his general taste, his general aesthetic taste and sensibility uh, in general? Number seven, a sense of living in, in, in a mappo. Uh, mappo, the kanji there is on your study guide. This is the age of the de degeneration of the Dharma or the Buddhist law. In Chinese, say, mo fa. Uh, a sense of living through this terrible age, this age of degeneration. Uh, degeneration runs throughout this text. Discuss Kenko's view that he is living in a degraded present and his nostalgic longing for a better past, an idyllic past. Uh, what is the age of that past? What, what, what is he referring to specifically when he talks about this ideal past that is now lost? Consider the historical context as well. Number eight. Throughout the work, Kong Kenko contrasts the well-bred the refined, the cultivated, the sensitive, or yokibito, as we say in classical Japanese, person with the vulgar, or the unrefined, or the boorish person. So he has these two sort of archetypes that he contrasts in several instances in this, S in this work. What, in his view, are the qualities of the yokibito, of the good person, the cultivated person? What are the qualities of those deplorably wanting in intelligence, as he says at one point in the essay? How do each archetypes behave, speak, carry themselves, and so forth? Number nine, discuss the references to emptiness that appear in the work. 
the mind as emptiness, the images of sky, and so forth. So this uh, very important Buddhist image and uh, sort of notion of emptiness is central to this work. Why does he say that attachment to the sky is the last t attachment that one should give up? So what does the sky represent in that statement that he makes? Consider these comments in the context of the Buddhist Buddhist notion of emptiness, or sunyata, as we say in Bongo, or Sanskrit. In Japanese, it's the kanji for soda, it's ku. Uh, number 10, consider the references to Chinese culture, specifically poetry, that appear in the work. So I think we have several references to Bai Zhoui and to Li Bai and the great uh, Chinese poets of the Tang Dynasty. How do these poems, ideas, themes, images inform his own poetic sensibility and religious sensibility and worldview and so forth. Number 11, what does Kenko say about procrastination? What is its cause? What remedy does he offer? Uh, and that's a very specific question and uh, it will be easy to find that passage in the excerpts that you have. Number 12, in fragment or essay number 105, he alludes to a conversation that he overheard at the door sill of a certain deserted temple between a man of obvious distinction and a woman who emitted an occasional enchanting whiff of some exquisite perfume. Using your imagination, write the dialogue for this conversation. So he doesn't give the specifics of their encounter, but what do you think they are talking about in this scene? And number 13, through though the work is overwhelmingly Buddhist in themes and images, there are some allusions to the native Shinto religion as well. Underline each of these Shinto allusions or references when, each time they come up and identify and discuss the significance of these passages. All right, make sure we're recording. We're good. Okay, click pause real uh, here. Okay, now I will turn the microphone over to Nicole San. She's going to read uh, the, uh, I think it's a total of 30 pages, 32 pages that are on the PDF file that you have from the Tsure Tsure Gusa by Yoshida Kenko, who, by the way, lived from 1185. No, <laughs> those, are, those dates are wrong there. We'll have to fix that. He didn't live to be 160. Um, okay, and here we go. Here's Nico Sayosko. Okay. okay. Preface. What a strange, demented feeling. Oh, wait, got notes. What a strange, demented feeling it gives me when I realize I've spent whole days before this inkstone with nothing better to do, jotting down at random whatever nonsensical thoughts have entered my head. One. It, it is enough. Essay, essay number one. Essay number one. It is enough, it would seem, to have been born into this world for a man to desire many things. The position of emperor, of course, is far too exalted for our aspirations. Even the remote descendants of the imperial line are sacred, for they are not of the seed of man. Ordinary nobles of a rank that entitles them to retainers, let alone those who stand in the soli solitary grandeur of the Chancellor, appear most impressive, and even their children and grandchildren, though their fortunes may decline, still possess a distinctive elegance. Persons of lower rank, fortunate enough to achieve some success in keeping with their station, are apt to wear looks of self-satisfaction and no doubt consider themselves most important, but, are actually, but actually they are quite insignificant. No one is less to be envied than a priest. Say Shogunon wrote of the priests when they seemed to outsiders like sticks of wood, an apt description. The clerics impress nobody, even when they found their authority and their importance is loudly proclaimed. It is easy to see why the holy man Soga should have said that the worldly fame is seemingly in priests, and that those who seek it violate the teachings of Buddha. A true hermit might, in fact, seem more admirable. It is desirable that a man's face and figure be of excelling beauty. I could sit forever with a man, provided that what he said did not grate on my ears, that he had charm, and that he did not talk very much. What an unpleasant experience it is when someone you have supposed to be quite distinguished reveals his true, inferior nature. A man's social position and looks are likely to be determined at birth, but why should a man, not a man's mind go from wisdom to greater wisdom if it is so disposed? What a shame it is when men of excellent appearance and character prove hopelessly inept in social encounters with their inferiors in both position and in appearance, solely because they are badly educated. A familiarity with orthodox scholarship, the ability to compose poetry in prose and Chinese, a knowledge of, of Japanese poetry and music are all desirable, and if a man can serve as a model to others in matters of precedent and court ceremony, he is truly impressive. The mark of an excellent man is that he writes easily in an acceptable hand, sings agreeably and in tune, and, though appearing reluctant to accept when wine is pressed on him, is not a teetotaler. Essay number seven. 
If a man were never to fade away like the dews of Adashino, never to vanish like the smoke over tri Tribeyama, Toribeyama, but lingered on forever in the world, how would things, things, how things would lose their power to move us? The most precious thing in life is its uncertainty. Consider living creatures. None lives so long as man. None lives so long as man. The mayfly waits not for the evening. The summer cicada knows neither spring nor autumn. What a wonderfully unhurried feeling it is to live even a single year in perfect serenity. I, if that is not enough for you, you might live a thousand years and still feel it was but a single night's dream. We cannot live forever in this world. Why should we wait for ugliness to overtake us? The longer man lives, the more shame he endures. To die, at the latest, before one reaches forty, is the least unattractive. Once a man passes that age, he desires, with no sense of shame over his appearance, to mingle in the companies of others. In his sunset years, he dotes on his grandchildren and prays for long life so that he may see them prosper. His preoccupation with worldly desires grows ever deeper, and gradually he loses all sensitivity to the beauty of things, a lamentable state of affairs. Essay number eight. Nothing leads a man astray so easily as sexual desire. What a foolish thing a man's heart is. Though we realize, for example, that fragrances are short-lived, and the scent burnt into cloth clothes lingers but briefly, how our hearts always leap when we catch a whiff of an exquisite perfume. The holy man of, Kum of Kume lost his magic powers after noticing the whiteness of the, of the legs of a girl who was washing clothes. This was quite understandable, considering that the glowing plumpness of her arms, legs, and flesh owed nothing to artifice. Essay number nine. Beautiful hair, of all things in a woman, is most likely to catch a man's eye. Her character and temperament may be guessed from the first words she utters, even if she is hidden behind a screen. When a woman somehow, perhaps unintentionally, has captured a man's heart, she is generally unable to sleep peacefully. She will not hesitate to subject herself to hardships, and will even endure cheerfully what she would normally find intolerable, all because love means so much to her. The love of men and women is truly a deep-seated passion with distinct roots. The sense gives, gives rise to many desires, but it should it be possible to shun them all. Only one, infatuation, is impossible to control. Old or young, wise or foolish, in this respect all seem identical. That is why they say that even a great elephant can be fastened securely with a rope plaited from the strands of a woman's hair, and that a flute made from a sandal a woman has worn will infallibly summon the autumn deer. We must guard against this delusion of the senses, which is to be dreaded and avoided. Essay number 10. A house, I know, is but a temporary abode, but how delightful it is to find one that has harmonious proportions in a pleasant atmosphere. One feels somehow that even moonlight, when it shines into the quiet domicile of a person of taste, is more affecting than elsewhere. A house, though it may not be in the current fashion nor elaborately decorated, will appeal to us by its unassuming beauty. A grove of trees with, indefinite, with an inde indefinitely ancient look, a garden where plants, growing of their own accord, have a special charm, a veranda and an open-work wooden fence of interesting construction, and a few personal effects left carelessly lying about, giving the place an air of having been lived in. A house which multitudes of workmen have polished with every care, where strange and rare Chinese and Japanese furnishings are displayed, and even the grasses and trees of the garden have been trained unnaturally, is ugly to look at and most depressing. How could anyone live for long in such a place? The most casual glance will suggest how likely a house is to turn in a, in a moment to smoke. A man's character, as a rule, may be known from the place where he lives. The Gotokuji minister stretched a rope across his roof to keep the kites from roosting. Saigyo, seeing the rope, asked, Why should it bother him if kites perch there? That shows, that shows you the kind of man this prince is. I have heard that Saigyo never visited him again. I remember this story not long ago when I noticed a rope stretched over the roof of the Kosaka Palace where Prince Ayanoko lives. Someone told me that, as a matter of fact, it has distressed the prince to see how crows clustering on the roof would swoop down to seize frogs in the pond. The story impressed me and made me wonder if Sanesada may not have also had such reason, some such reason. Essay number 11. About the tenth month, I had the occasion to visit a village beyond the place called Kurosano. I made my way far down a moss-covered path until I reached a lonely-looking hut. Not a sound could be heard, except for the dripping of a water pipe buried in fallen leaves. Sprays of chrysanthemum and red maple leaves had been carelessly arranged on the holy water shelf. 
Evidently, somebody was living here. Moved, I was thinking. One can live even in such a place. When I noticed in the garden beyond a great tangerine tree, its branches bent with the fruit that had been enclosed by a forbidding fence. Rather disillusioned, I thought now, if only the tree had not been there. Essay number 13. The pleasantest of all diversions is to sit alone under the lamp, a book spread before you, and to make friends with the people of a distant past you have never known. The books I would choose are the moving volumes of Wen Su Sang, the collected works of Po Chu Yi, and the sayings of Lao Tzu, and the chapters of Chong Tzu. Among works by scholars of this country, those written long ago are often quite interesting. Essay number 19. The changing of the seasons is deeply moving in its every manifestation. People seem to agree that autumn is the best season to appreciate the beauty of things. That may well be true, but the sights of spring are even more exhilarating. The cries of the birds gradually take on a peculiarly spring-like quality, and in the gentle sunlight the bushes begin to sprout among the fence along the fences. Then, as spring deepens, mists spread over the landscape, and the cherry blossoms seem ready to open, only for steady rains and winds to cause them to scatter precipitously. The heart is subject to incessant pangs of emotion as the young leaves are growing out. Orange blossoms are famous for evoking memories, but the fragrance of plum, blo plum blossoms, above all, makes us return to the past and remember nostalgically long-ago events. Nor can we overlook the clean loveliness of the Yamabuki or the uncertain beauty of wisteria and so many other compelling sights. Someone once remarked, In summers when the feasts of anointing the Buddha and the Kamo festival come around, the young leaves on the treetops grow thick and cool, our sensitivity to the touching beauty of the world and our longing for our absent friends grows stronger. Indeed. This is so. When in the fifth month the irises bloom and the rice seedlings are transplanted, can anyone remain untroubled by the drumming of the water rails? Then in the sixth month you can see the whiteness of the moonflowers glowing over wretched ho hovels, and the smoldering of mosquito, mosquito incense is affecting too. The purification rites of the sixth month are also engrossing. The, celebrating of, the celebration of Tanabata is charming. Then as the nights gradually become cold and the wind geese cry, under the leaves of the haggy turn yellow, and men harvest and dry the first crop of rice. So many moving sights come together, in autumn especially, and how unforgettable it is the morning after an equinoctial storm. As I go on, I realize that these sights have long since been enumerated in the tale of Genji in the pillow book, but I make no pretense of trying to avoid saying the same things again. If I fail to say what lies on my mind, it gives me a feeling of, fat of flatulence. I shall therefore give my brush free rein. Mine is a foolish diversion, but these pages are meant to be torn up, and no one is likely to see them. To return to the subject, winter decay is hardly less beautiful than autumn. Crimson leaves lie scattered on the ground beside the ponds, and how very delightful it is on a morning when the frost is very white to see the vapor rise from a garden stream. And the end of the year is an indescribably moving to see everyone hurrying about on errands. There is something forlorn about the waning winter moon, shining cold and clear in the sky, unwatched because it is said to be depressing. The invocation of the Buddha names and the departure of the messages with the imperial offerings are moving and inspiring. How impressive it is that so many palace ceremonials are performed besides all the preparations for the new year. It is striking that the worship of the four directions follows directly on the expulsion of the demons. On the last night of the year, when it is extremely dark, people light pine torches and go rushing about, pounding on the gates of strangers until well after midnight. I wonder what it signifies. After they have done, what they're, done with their exaggerated shouting and running so furiously that their feet hardly touch the ground, the noise at last fades away with the coming of dawn, leaving a lonely feeling of regret over the departing old year. The custom of paying homage to the dead, and the belief that they return that night, has lately disappeared from the capital, but I was deeply moved to discover that it was still performed in the east. As the day thus breaks on the new year, the sky seems no different from what it was the day before but one feels somehow changed and renewed. The main thoroughfares, decorated in their full length with pine bros, seem cheerful and festive, and this too is profoundly affecting. Essay number 20. A certain hermit once said, There is one thing that even I, who have no worldly entanglements, would be sorry to give up, the beauty of the sky. I can understand why he should have felt that way. Essay number 25. The world is as, uh, is as unstable as the pools and shallows of Asuka River. Times change and things disappear. Joy and sorrow come and go. 
a place that once thrived turns into an uninhabited moor, a house that may remain unaltered, but its occupants will have changed. The peach and the damson trees in the garden say nothing. With whom is one to reminisce about the past? I feel this sense of impermanence even more sharply when I see the remains of a house which long ago, before I knew it, must have been imposing. Whenever I pass by the ruins of the Kyogoku Palace, the Hojoji, and similar buildings, it moves me to think of the aspiration of the builders still lingers on, though the edifices themselves has changed completely. When Fujiwara no Michinaga and erected so magnificent a temple, bestowing so many estates for its support, he supposed that his descendants would always assist the emperor and serve as pillars of the state. Could he have imagined that the temple would fall into such ruin, no matter what times lay ahead? The great gate and the golden hall were still standing until recent years, but the gate burned during the Showa era, and the golden hall soon afterwards fell over. It still lies there, and no attempt has been made to restore it. Only the Muryoju Hall remains as a memento of the temper's former glory. Nine images of Amida Buddha, each sixteen feet tall, stand in a row most awesomely. It is extremely moving to see, still plainly visible, the plaque inscribed by the major counselor Kose and the door inscription by Kanayuki. I understand that the Hoke Hall and perhaps other buildings are still standing. I wonder how much longer they too will last. Some buildings that lack even such remains may survive merely as foundation stones, but no one knows for certain to what they once belonged. It is true in all things that it is a futile business attempting to plan for a future no one will know. Essay 29 When I sit down in great meditation, the one emotion hardest to fight against is a longing in all things for the past. After the others have gone to bed, I pass the time on a long autumn's night by putting in order whatever, whatever belongings are at hand. As I tear up scraps of old correspondence I should prefer not to leave behind, I sometimes find among them samples of the calligraphy of a friend who has died, or pictures he drew for his own amusement, and I feel exactly as I did at the time. Even with letters written by friends who are still alive, I try, when it has been long since we met, to remember the circumstances, the year. What a moving experience that is. It is sad to think that a man's familiar possessions, indifferent to his death, should remain unaltered long after he is gone. Essay number 30. Nothing is sadder than the time after a death. During the 49 days of mourning, the family, having moved to a temple in the mountains or some such place, foregathers in large numbers in, in inconvenient, cramped quarters, and frantically occupies itself with the motions of mourning for the dead. The days pass unbelievably fast. On the final day, all civility gone, no one has a word for anybody else, and each man, with airs of knowing exactly what is to be done, sets about packing his belongings. Then all go their separate ways. Once they have returned home, many sad remembrances are sure to afflict them anew. Sometimes I hear people say on such occasions, It's bad luck to mention such and such a thing. You should avoid it for the family's sake. How can people worry about such things in the midst of so great a tragedy? The insensitivity of people still appalls me. We do not by any means forget the dead, even after months and years have gone by, but, as they say, the departed one grows more distant each day. We may deny it, but, no doubt because our sorrow is not as sharp as it was at the time, we talk about foolish things, we smile. The body is interred in some lonely mountain and visited only at the required times. Before long, the grave marker is covered with moss and buried in fallen leaves. The evening storm and night moon become the only regular mourners. As long as people remember the deceased person and miss him, all is still well, but before long those people too disappear, and the descendants, who, the, who only knew the man from reports, are hardly likely to feel deep emotion. Once the services honoring the dead man cease, nobody knows who he was or even his name. Only the sight of the spring weeds sprouting each year by his grave will stir the emotions of sensitive people. But, in the end, even the pine that grown in the storm winds is broken into firewood before it reaches its allotted thousand years, and the old grave is plowed up and turned into rice land. How sad it is that even his last memento of the dead should vanish. Essay number 38. What a foolish thing it is to be governed by desire for fame and profit and to fret away, one, and to fret away one's whole life without a moment of peace. Great wealth is no guarantee of security. Wealth, in fact, tends to attract calamities and disaster. Even if, after you die, you leave enough gold to prop up the North Star, it will only prove a nuisance to your heirs. The pleasures that delight the foolish man are likewise meaningless to the man of discrimination 
who considers a big carriage, sleek horses, gold, and jeweled ornaments all equally undesirable and senseless. You had best throw away your gold in the mountains and drop your jewels into a ravine. It is an, exceed it is an exceedingly stupid man who will torment himself for the, sake of for the sake of worldly gain. To leave behind a reputation that will not perish through the long ages to come is certainly to be desired, but can one say that one can say of men of high rank and position are necessarily superior? There are foolish and incompetent men who, having been born into an illustrious family and, being favored by the times, rise to an exalted position and indulge themselves in the extremes of luxury. There are also many learned and good men who by their own choice remain in humble position and end their days without ever having encountered good fortune. A feverish craving for high rank and position is second and foolish only to seeking wealth. One would like to leave behind a glorious reputation for surpassing wisdom and character, but careful reflection will show that what we mean by love of a glorious reputation is delight in the appropriation of, in the approbation of others. Neither those who praise nor those who abuse last for long, and the people who have heard the reports are likely to depart the world as quickly. But for, before whom, then, should we feel ashamed? By whom should we wish to be appreciated? Fame, moreover, inspires backbiting. It does no good whatsoever to have one's home, one's name survive. A craving after fame is next most foolish. If I were to address myself to those who nevertheless seek desperately to attain knowledge and wisdom, I would say that knowledge leads to deceit, and artistic talent is the product of much suffering. True knowledge is not what one hears from others or requires through study. What, then, are we to call knowledge? Proper and improper come to one and the same thing. Can we call anything good? The truly enlightened man has no learning, no virtue, no accomplishments, no fame. Who knows of him? Who will report his glory? It is not that he conceals his virtue or pretends to be stupid. It is because from the outside he is above distinctions between wise and foolish, between profit and loss. If, in your delusion, you seek fame and profit, the result will be as I have described. All is unreality. Nothing is worth discussing, worth desiring. Essay number 41. On the fifth day of the fifth month, I went to see the horse race at the Kamo Shrine. There was such a mob before our carriage, between us and the view, that we could see nothing. We all got out of the carriage and pushed towards the railing, but the crowd was particularly dense in that area, and there seemed no chance of making our way to the front, to the foray. Just then we noticed a priest perched on the crotch of an ochi tree, across the way, watching the race. Even as he clung to the tree, he was nodding drowsily, again and again waking himself up just as he seemed to fall, about to fall. People, observing the priest, laughed at his folly. What an idiot! Imagine anyone being able to sleep so peacefully when he's sitting on such a dangerous branch. It occurred to me, however, the hour of death may be upon us at any moment. To spend our days in pleasure-seeking, forgetful of this truth, is even more foolish. I blurted out the words, and someone standing before me said, That's certainly true. It is the most stupid way to behave. Turning round towards us, they said, Please come through here, and made room, urging us to take their places. Anybody at all might have made the same observation, and but probably it came as a surprise at that particular moment and struck home. Man, not being made of wood or stone, is at times not without emotional reactions. Essay number 45. Kinyo, an officer of the second rank, had a brother called the high priest Yogaku, an extremely bad-tempered man. Next to his monastery grew a large nettle tree which occasioned the nickname people gave him, the nettle tree high priest. That name is outrageous, said the high priest, and cut down the tree. The stump still being left, people referred to him now as the stump high priest. More furious than ever, Ryogoku had the stump dug up and thrown away, but this left a big ditch. People now called him the ditch high priest. Essay number 53. This story, too, is about a priest at Ninaji. A farewell party was being offered for an acolyte about to become a priest, and the guests were all drinking merry when one of the priests, drunk and carried away by high spirits, picked up a three-legged cauldron nearby and clamped it over his head. It caught on his nose, but he flattened it down, pulled the pot over his face, and danced out among the others, to the great amusement of everyone. After the priest had been dancing for a while, he tried to pull the pot off, but it refused to be budged. A, pale fell over, a pall fell over the gathering, and people wondered blankly what to do. They tried one thing and another, only succeeding in bruising the skin around his neck. The blood streamed down, and the priest's neck became so swollen that he had trouble breathing. The others tried to split the pot, but it was not easily broken, and the reverberations inside were unbearable. 
Finally, when all else had failed, they threw up a thin garment over the legs of the pot, which stuck up like horns, and, giving the priest a stick to lean on, led him by the hand to a doctor in, Co in Kyoto. People they met on the way stared at this apparition with unconstrained astonishment. The priest presented a most extraordinary sight as he sat inside the doctor's office facing him. Whatever he said came out unintelligible, muffled roar. Came out as an unintelligible, muffled roar. I can't find any similar case in my medical books, said the doctor, and there aren't any oral traditions either. The priest had no choice but to return to the Ninaji, where his close friends and aged mother gathered at his bedside, weeping with grief, though the priest himself probably could not hear them. At this point, somebody suggested, wouldn't it be better at least to save his life, even if he loses his nose and ears? Let's try pulling the pot off with all our strength. They stuffed straw around the priest's neck to protect it from the metal, and then pulled hard enough to tear off his head. Only holes were left to show where his nose and ears had been, but the pot was removed. They barely managed to save the priest's life, and for a long time afterwards, he was gravely ill. <clears throat> Essay number 55. Wow, it just ends like that. A house should be built with the summer in mind. In winter it is possible to live anywhere, but a badly made house is unbearable when it gets hot. There is nothing cool looking about deep water. A shallow falling stream is far cooler. When you are reading fine print, you will find that a room with sliding doors is lighter than one with hinged shutters. A room with a high ceiling is cold in the winter and dark by lamplight. People agree that a house which has plenty of spare room is attractive to look. And it may put a attractive to look at, and it may be put to different, many different uses. A man who has determined to take the great step should leave unresolved all plans for disposing of urgent or worrisome business. Some men think, I'll wait a bit longer until I take care of this matter, or I might as well dispose of that business first, or people will surely laugh at me if I leave such and such as it stands. I'll arrange things now so that there won't be any future criticism. Or, I've managed to survive all these years. I'll wait till that matter is cleared up. It won't take long. I mustn't be hasty. But if you think in such terms, the day for taking the great step will never come, for you will keep discovering more and more unavoidable problems, and there will never be a time when you run out of unfinished business. My observation of people leads me to conclude, generally speaking, that even people with some degree of intelligence are likely to go through life supposing they have ample time before then. But would a man fleeing because a fire has broken out in his neighborhood say to the fire, Wait a moment, please. To save his life, a man will run away, indifferent to shame, abandoning his possessions. Is a man's life any more likely to wait for him? Death attacks faster than fire or water, and is harder to escape. When its hour comes, can you refuse to give up your aged parents, your little children, your duty to your master, your affections for others, because they are hard to abandon? Essay number 74. They flock together like ants hurry east and west, run north and south. Some are mighty, some humble, some are aged, some young. They have places to go, houses to return to. At night they sleep, in the morning get up. But what does all this activity mean? There is no ending to their greed for long life, their grasping for profit. What expectations have they that they, have, that they take such good care of themselves? All that awaits them in the end is old age and death, whose coming is swift and does not falter for one instant. What joy can there be while waiting for this end? The man who is deluded by fame and profit does not fear the approach of old age and death because he is so intoxicated by worldly cravings that he never stops to consider how near he is to his destination. The foolish man, for his part, grieves because he desires everlasting life and is ignorant of the law of universal change. Pause it for a second. No. Was, it, was it 104? Do you remember me? Um, okay. Essay number 75. I wonder what, ins what feelings inspire a man to complain of having nothing to do. I am happiest when I have nothing to distract me, and I am completely alone. If a man conforms to society, his mind will be captured by the filth of the outside world, and he is easily led astray. If he mingles in society, he must be careful that his words do not offend others, and what he says will not at all be what he feels in his heart. He will joke with others only to quarrel with them, now resentful, now happy, his feelings in constant turmoil. Calculations of advantage will wantonly intrude, and not a moment will be free from considerations of profit and loss. Intoxication is added to the delusion, and in a state of inebriation the man dreams. 
People are all alike. They spend their days running about frantically, oblivious to their insanity. Even if a man has not yet discovered the path of enlightenment, as long as he removes himself from his worldly ties, leads a quiet life, and maintains his peace of mind by avoiding entanglements, he may be said to be happy, at least for the time being. It is written in Makash break with Break your ties with your daily activities, with personal affairs, with your arts, and with learning. Essay number 82. Somebody once remarked that, the thin, that thin silk was not satisfactory as a scroll wrapping because it was so easily torn. Tona replied, It is only after the silk wrapper has frayed at the top and bottom, and the mother of pearl have fall, has fallen from the roller, that a scroll looks beautiful. This opinion demonstrated the excellent taste of the man. People often say that a set of books looks ugly if all volumes are not in the same format, but I was impressed to hear the Abbot Kolyu say, It is typical of the unintelligent man to insist on assembling complete sets of everything. Imperfect sets are better. In everything, no matter what it may be, uniformity is undesirable. Leaving something incomplete makes it interesting, and gives one the feeling that there is room for growth. Someone once told me, even when building the imperial palace, they always leave one place unfinished. In both Buddhist and Confucian writings of the philosophers of former times, there are always many missing chapters. Essay number 89. Someone remarked, in the mountains there is a man-eating beast called the Nekomata. Another man said, they are not only found in the mountains. Even in this neighborhood, cats have grown into Nekomata, with time and experience, and some have been known to eat people. A priest named Amida Butsu, a linked verse poet who lived near the Gyoganji, heard this story and decided that he would have to be more careful henceforth when he traveled alone. Not long afterwards, he was returning home alone after having spent much of the night composing linked verse at a certain place. He had reached the bank of a stream, when suddenly a Nekomata, looking exactly as it had, as it had been described, bounded up to his feet. It leaped on the priest and tried to bite his throat. The priest was so terrified that he had not the strength to defend himself. His legs gave way and he tumbled into the river, crying, Help! A Nekomata! A Nekomata is after me! People came running out from nearby houses with lighted torches and found the priest, a well-known figure in the neighborhood. What happened? they cried. When they lifted him from the river, they discovered he had fallen in when the fan and little boxes won his prizes for his linked verse cr with... <laughs> He had fallen in with the fan and little boxes, won his prizes for his linked verse, clutched to his bosom. Looking as if only a miracle had saved him, he crawled back into his house. Apparently his dog, recognizing its master in the dark, had jumped on him. Essay number 92 A certain man, who was learning to shoot a bow, aimed at the target with, th with two arrows in his hand. His teacher said, A beginner should not hold two arrows. It will make him rely on the second arrow and be careless with the first. Each time you shoot, you should think not of hitting or missing the target, but of making this one the decisive arrow. I wonder if anyone with two arrows would be careless with one of them and the presence of his teacher. But though the pupil is himself unaware of any carelessness, the teacher will notice it. This caution applies to all things. A man studying some branch of learning thinks at night that he has the, day, the next day before him, and in the morning that he will have time in the night, and that he plans this way... He plans in this way always to study more diligently at some future time. How much harder it is to perceive the laziness of mind that arises in an instant. Why should it be so different to do something now, in the present moment? Essay number 104. A certain man, thinking to call on a woman who had been living alone in a dilapidated, in dilapidated lodgings, bore with her retainers during an enforced absence from the court, when secretly in search of her dwelling by the light of an early moon. Her dogs, suspicious of the intruder, barked ferociously at him, and a, scully, a scullery maid came out to demand, Who is it, please? The man persuaded her to admit him directly. His first glimpse of the forlorn appearance of the place made him feel sorry for the woman, and he wondered how she could endure living there. He stood for a while on the scruffy wooden floor until a waiting woman appeared and addressed him in a soft but youthful voice. This way, please, she said. He went through a door that slid open reluctantly. The interior of the house was not especially gloomy. In the distance, bright enough to reveal the beauty of the furnishings, and an incense that clearly had been burning for a long time made the place seem delightful to live in. Make sure the gate is securely fastened. I'm afraid it may rain. Put his carriage under the gate roof, and see that his people have somewhere to rest, a voice said. Then someone whispered, Tonight, we should be able to enjoy a good night's rest. She spoke so softly, 
as not to be heard, but the room was so small he faintly caught her words. Later, as the gentleman was relating in detail the many things that had happened since, since they last met, the first cock crows sounded in the late night. As their intimate conversation ranged from past to future, the cock crows, louder than before, became incessant, and he wondered if the day was breaking. But as this did not seem a place where one must hurry off while the night is still dark, he tarried a bit longer. When the cracks in the shutters showed white, he whispered final endearments that left an unforgettable impression, and got up to depart. It was a dawn in May, when the treetops in the garden were a dazzling mass of green. Even now he recalls the charm and the loveliness of the scene, and when he passes the house, he turns back to gaze at the tall bay tree until it disappears from sight. Essay number 109 a man who was famous as a tree climber was guiding someone in climbing a tall tree. He ordered the man to cut the top branches, and during this time, when the man seemed to be in great danger, the expert said nothing. Only when the man was coming down and had reached the height of the eaves, the leaves, did the expert call out, Be careful! Watch your step coming down. I asked him, Why did you say that? At that height he could jump the rest of the way if he chose. That's the point, said the expert. As long as the man was at, up at a dizzy height and the branches were threatening to break, he himself was so afraid I said nothing. Mistakes are always made when people get to the easy places. This man belonged to the lowest class, but his words were filled in perfect accord with the prestiges of the sages. In football, too, they say that after you've kicked out, you have kicked out of a difficult place and you think the next one will be easier, you are sure to miss the ball. Episode number... Essay number 110. I once asked a man to read, man rated as a champion back, backgammon player of the secret of his success. He said, you should never play to win, but so, not as, but so as not to lose. Decide which moves will lead to a quick defeat and avoid them, choosing instead moves which seem likely to result in a slower defeat, if only by one throw of the dice. This was the teaching of an expert in his art. The same holds true also of how a man should control his conduct or, rule, or a ruler govern the state. Essay number 137. Are we to look at cherry blossoms only in full bloom, the moon only when it is cloudless? To long for the moon while looking in the rain, to lower the blinds and be unaware of the passing of the spring, these are even more deeply moving. Branches about to blossom or gardens strewn with flated flowers are worthier of our admiration. Our poems written as, on such themes as going to view the cherry blossoms only to find they had scattered, or on being prevented from, seeing, from visiting the blossoms, inferior to those on seeing the blossoms. People commonly regret that the cherry blossoms scatter, or that the moon sinks in the sky, and this is natural, but only an exceptionally sense insensitive man would say, this branch and that branch have lost their blossoms. There is nothing worth seeing now. In all things, it is the beginning and ends that are interesting. Does the love between men and women refer only to the moments when they are in each other's arms? The man who grieves over a love affair broken off before it was fulfilled, who bewails empty vows, who spends long autumn nights alone, who lets his thoughts wander to distant skies, who yearns for the past in, in a dilapidated house, such a man truly knows what love means. The moon that appears close to dawn, after we have long waited for it, moves us more profoundly than the moon shining cloudless over a thousand leaves. And how incomparably lovely is the moon, almost greenish in its light, when seen through the tops of the cedars deep in the mountains, or when it hides for a moment behind the clustering clouds during a sudden shower. The sparkle on hickory or white oak leaves, seemingly wet with moonlight, strikes one to the heart. One suddenly misses the capital, longing for a friend who could share the moment. In our weeks look at the moon and the cherry blossoms with our eyes alone? How much more evocative and pleasing is it, is it to think about the spring without stirring from the house, to dream of the moonlit night, though we remain in our room? The man of breeding never appears to abandon himself completely to his pleasures. Even his manner of enjoyment is detached. It is the rustic boars who take all their pleasures grossly. They squirm their way through the, the crowd to get under the trees. They stare at the blossoms with eyes for nothing else. They drink sake and compose linked verse, and finally they heartlessly break off great branches and cart them away. When they see a spring, they dip their hands and feet to cool them. If it is, they, if it is the snow, they jump down to leave their footprints. No matter what the sight, they are never content merely with looking at it. Such people have a very peculiar manner of watching the Kamo festival. The procession's awfully late, they say. There's no point waiting in the stands for it to come. 
They go off then to a shack behind the stand where they will drink and eat, play Go or Bakamon, leave somebody in the stands to warn them. When he cries, it's passing now, each of them dashes out in wild consternation, struggling to be the first back into the stands. They all but fall from their perches as they push out the blinds and press against one another for a better look, staring at the scene, determined not to miss a thing. They comment on everything that goes by with cries of, Look at this! Look at that! When the procession has passed, they scramble down, saying, No, we'll be back for the next one. All they are interested in is what they can see. People from the capital, the better sort, doze during the processions, hardly looking at all. Young underlings are constantly moving about, performing their master's errands, and persons in attendance seated behind never stretch forward in an unseemly manner. No one is intent on seeing the procession at all costs. It is charming on the day of the festival to see garlands of hollyhock hawk leaves carelessly strewn over everything. The morning of the festival, before dawn breaks, you wonder who the owners of the carriages who the owners are of the carriages silently drawn up in place and guess that one is his or his, and have your guesses confirmed when someone you recognize a coachman or a servant. Sometimes you recognize a coachman or a servant. I never weary of watching the different carriages going back and forth, some delightfully unpretentious, others magnificent. By the time it is growing dark, you wonder where the rows of carriages and those dense crowd of spectators have diverse, disappeared to. Before you know it, hardly a soul is left, and the congestion of returning carriages is over. And then they start removing the blinds and matting from the stands, and the place, even as you watch, begins to look desolate. You realize with a pang of grief that life is like this. You have seen the avenues of the city, you have seen the festival. I suddenly realized from the large number of people I could recognize in this crowd's to pass recognizing the crowds passing to and fro before the stands, that there were not so many people in the world after all. Even if I were not to die until all of them had gone, I should not have long to wait. If you pierce a tiny aperture in a large vessel filled with water, even though only a small amount drips out, the constant leakage will empty the vessel. In this capital, with all its many people, surely a day never passes without someone dying. And are there merely one or two deaths a day? On some days, certainly, many more than one or two are seen to their graves at Toribeno, Fuanoka, Fuanooka, and other mountainsides, but never a day passes without a single funeral. That is why coffin makers never have any to spare. It does not matter how young or how strong you may be, the hour of death comes sooner than you expect. It is an extraordinary miracle that you should have escaped to this day. Do you suppose you have even the briefest respite in which to relax? When you make a mamogodate with bakamon counters, at first, you cannot tell which of the stones are arranged before you will take will be arranged before you will be taken away. Your count then falls on a certain stone, and you remove it. The others seem to have escaped, but as you renew the count, you will thin out the pieces one by one until none is left. Death is like that. The soldier who goes to war, knowing how close he is to death, forgets his family and even forgets himself. The man who has turned his back on his on the world and lives in a thatched hut quietly taking pleasures in the streams and rocks of his garden, may suppose that death in battle has nothing to do with him, but this is a shallow misconception. Does he imagine that, if he hides in the still recesses of the mountains, the enemy called change will fail to attack? When you confront death, no matter where it may be, it is the same as charging into battle. Essay 142 Even a man who seems devoid of intelligence occasionally says an apt word. A fierce-looking brute of a soldier once asked a companion, "'Have you got any kids?' "'Not one,' replied the other. "'Then,' said the soldier, "'I don't suppose you know what deep feelings are. "'You probably haven't a drop of human warmth in you. "'That's a frightening thought. "'It's having children that makes people understand the beauty of life.' "'He was right. "'Would any tenderness of feeling exist in such a man's heart "'if not for the natural affection between parent and child? "'Even the man with no sense of duty towards his parents "'learns what parental solitude, solicitude means,' when he is a child of his own. It is wrong for anyone who has abandoned the world and is without attachments to despise other men burdened with the many encumbrances for their deep-seated greed and constant fawning on others. If he could put himself in the place of the men he despises, he would see that, for the sake of their parents, wives, and children, whom they truly love, they all forget a sense of shame and will even steal. I believe, therefore, that it would be better, instead of imprisoning thieves and concerning ourselves only with the punishing crimes, to run the country in such a way that no man would ever be hungry or cold. When a man lacks steady employment, his heart is not steady, and in extremity he will steal. As long as the country is not properly governed, and people suffer from cold and hunger, there will never be an end to crime. 
It is pitiful to make people suffer, to force them to break the law, and then to punish them. How then may we help the people? If those at the top would give up their luxury and wastefulness, protect the people, and encourage agriculture, those below would unquestionably benefit greatly. The real criminal is the man who commits a crime even though he has a normal share of food and clothing. Essay 155 A man who wishes to swim at the tide should first find out the prevailing moods. An untimely statement will offend the ears of the listener and hurt their feelings, and in the end will fail to achieve its purpose. One would do well to recognize such occasion when they arise. But falling sick, bearing children, or dying, those things alone take no season into account. They never cease because the occasion is unfavorable. The truly important things, birth, growth, sickness, and death, are like the surge of a powerful river. They plunge forward on their course, never pausing an instant. That is why you may not speak of prevailing moods with respect to matters of real consequence, whether religious or mundane, which you are determined to carry out to completion. You may not hesitate over this or that, merely marking time. It is not that when spring draws to a close it becomes summer, or that when summer ends the autumn comes. Spring itself urges the summer to show itself, and even while the summer is still with us, the autumn is already intruding, and the chill of autumn becomes winter cold. In the tenth month there is a spell of spring-like weather. The grass turns green, the plum trees bud. With the falling of the leaves, too, it is not, the fir it is not that first the leaves fall, and then young shoots form. The leaves fall because the budding from underneath is too powerful to resist. The impetuous for this change being provided from underneath, the process of shifting from one to the next, occurs extremely fast. The shifts from birth to age, from sickness to death, are even faster. The four seasons, after all, have an appointed order. The hour of death waits not its turn. Death does not necessarily come from the front. It may be stealthily planning an attack from behind. Everyone knows of death, but it comes unexpectedly, when people st feel they still have time, that death is not imminent. It is like the dry flats that stretch far out into the sea, only for the tide suddenly to flood over them onto the shore. Essay 184 The mother of Tokiyori, the governor of Sagami, was called the Zen nun of Matsushita. Once, when she had governed the go invited the governor to her, her, her hermitage, the nun herself took a small knife and cut around the broken places in the paper shoji, preparing them with new paper. Her brother Yoshikage, the vice governor of Akita Castle, who was there preparing the reception for that day, said, Let me do it. I'll have a servant of mine repair the shoji. He knows about all such things. She replied, I'm sure your servant's work wouldn't be any better than mine. She went on papering the shoji one pane at a time. Yoshikage, pursuing the matter, said, it would be far easier to repair the whole shoji at one time. Besides, don't you think it looks patchy and ugly this way? I intended to repair the whole thing after his visit, but I've purposely chosen to do it this way, just for today. I would like to have the young man notice this and realize that it is possible to go on using things by repairing just the broken parts. This was a most impressive gesture. The art of governing a country is founded on thrift. The nun, though a woman, acted in keeping with the spirit of the sages. Truly, she was no ordinary woman, for she had her son a man who preserved the order of the state. Essay number 188. A certain man, deciding to make his son a priest, said, You will study and learn the principles of cause and effect, and you will then preach sermons to earn a livelihood. The son, doing as instructed, learned how to ride a horse as a first step towards becoming a preacher. He thought that when people wanted him to conduct a service, they would probably send a horse for him, since he owned neither a palaquin nor a carriage, and it would be embarrassing if, because of his awkwardness in the saddle, he fell from the horse. Next, thinking that if, after the service, he were offered some sake and had no social graces to display, the donor would be disappointed, he learned to sing popular songs. When he was at last able to pass, pass muster in these two arts, he felt anxious to attain real proficiency. He devoted himself so diligently to his practice that he had no time to learn preaching, and in the meantime he had grown old. The priest was not the only one. The story is typical of people in general. When they are young, they are concerned about the projects they foresee lying ahead of them in the distant future, establishing themselves in different professions and carrying out some great undertaking, mastering an art, acquiring learning, but they think of their lives as stretching out indefinitely, and idly allow themselves to be conducting, constantly distracted by things directly before their eyes. They pass months and days in this manner, succeeding in none of their plans, and so they grow old. In the end, they neither become proficient in their profession, nor do they gain the eminence they anticipated. However, they regret it, 
They cannot roll back the years, but decline more and more rapidly, like a wheel rolling downhill. In the view of above, we must carefully compare in our minds all the different things in life we might hope to make our principal work, and decide which one is of the greatest value. This decided, we should renounce our other interests and devote ourselves to that one thing only. Many projects present themselves in the course of a day or even an hour. We must perform those that offer even slightly greater advantages, renouncing the others and giving ourselves entirely to whatever is most important. If we remain attached to them all and are reluctant to give up any, we will not accomplish a single thing. It is like a goal player who, not wasting a move, gets the jump on his opponent by sacrificing a small advantage to achieve a great one. It is easy, of course, to sacrifice three stones in order to gain ten. The hard thing is to sacrifice ten stones in order to gain eleven. A man should be ready to choose the course which is superior even by one stone, but when it comes to sacrificing ten, he feels reluctant, and it is hard to make an exchange which will not yield many additional stones. If we hesitate to give up what we have, and at the same time are eager to grab what the other man holds, we shall certainly fail to get his peace and lose our own. A man living in the capital has urgent business in the eastern hills, and has already reached the house of destination when it occurs to him that if he goes to the western hills, he may reap greater advantages. In that case, he should turn back at the gate and proceed to the western hills. If, however, he thinks, I've come all this way, I might as well take care of my business here first. There was no special day set for my business in the western hills. I'll go there some other time after I have returned. The sloth of a moment will turn, into a, in, will turn in this manner into the sloth of an entire lifetime. This is to be dreaded. If you are determined to carry out one particular thing, you must not be upset at that other things fall through, nor should you be embarrassed by other people's laughter. A great enterprise is unlikely to be achieved except at the sacrifice of everything else. Once, at a large gathering, a certain man said, Some people say, Mazuho no Suzuki, others say, Mazuho no Suzuki. The holy man of Watanabe knows the secret tradition of this pronunciation. The priest Soren, who was present at the gathering and heard this remark, said, it being raining at the time, Has anyone a raincoat and umbrella he can lend me? I intend to call on this holy man of Watanabe and find out about the Suzuki. People said, You shouldn't get so excited. Wait until the rain stops. The priest replied, What a foolish thing to say. Do you suppose that a man's life will wait for the rain to clear? If I should die or the priest pass away in the meantime, could I inquire about it then? So saying, he hurried out and went to study the tradition. This struck me as a most unusual and valid story. It is written in the Analects that, in speed there is success. Just as Torin was impatient to learn about the Suzuki, we should be impatient to discover the sources of enlightenment. Essay number 241. The full moon does not keep its roundness even a little while. It at once begins to wane. The man indifferent to such things may not see much change in the course of a single night. The worsening of an illness, too, does not pause in its headlong course, until the hour of death approaches. However, as long as a man's illness is not so critical that he is actually confronted by death, he grows accustomed to the idea that life will go on much the same forever, and only after he has accomplished many things in his life will he turn to quiet practice of the way. But when a man is suddenly taken ill and faced by death, he realizes that he has accomplished not one of his plans. He helplessly regrets the years and months of laziness and resolves that if he should recover this time and live out his life full, he will unflaggingly strive days and nights on end to accomplish this or that. The sickness in the meantime grows steadily worse until he loses consciousness and, in a state of violent agitation, breathes his last. This is true of the vast majority of people. Everyone should waste no time in taking this to heart. If you imagine that once you have accomplished your ambitions, you will have time to turn to the way, you will discover that your ambitions never come to an end. In our dreamlike existence, what is there for us to accomplish? All are vain delusions. You should realize that, if desires form in your heart, false delusions are leading you astray. You should do nothing to fulfill them. Only when you abandon everything without hesitation and turn to the way, will your mind and body, unhindered and unagitated, enjoy lasting peace. Translated by Donald Keene. Okay, that concludes uh, Nicole's recitation of the uh, excerpts from the Today Did a Good Time. We will discuss them more in class. And uh, in the description below this video, I will put all the links to uh, the full uh, books for those who would like to read uh, this work in its entirety, either in the uh, Donald Keene's translation that came out 50, 60 years ago almost, and uh, as well as some links to uh, Japanese versions, both in the, classic, the original classical with the annotations, 
as well as um, contemporary Japanese uh, adaptations or, or retranslations into contemporary Japanese of those works as well. So all the details will be in the description below. I will see you all in class and we will discuss this work in more detail. Say goodbye to the people. Thank you, Nicole. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>